Now on the launch pad, the orbiter is ready to take on its main payload. Testing assures that the multi-ton cargo is secure and safely stowed in the payload bay before the technicians certify the orbiter is ready for launch. Flying T-38 aircraft from Ellington Field in Houston, the crew members arrive at Kennedy's shuttle landing facility. But finally the day comes when you're there and you're getting ready to launch. And you go into launch countdown and it's like going up the hill on that roller coaster. It's full of expectation and you're both thrilled and terrified at the same time because anything could go wrong, but when it goes right, it's a thing of beauty. If there are no issues or concerns, technicians begin fueling the external tank with volatile liquid hydrogen and oxygen. The predominant emotion is pride. There's a tremendous sense of pride in all that, that not only that you do, but that your teammates do, that people in this, this very firing room do, and folks all across the country. This is shuttle launch control, T minus nine minutes. At the T minus nine minute hold, the launch director leads one final pull. We finally come out of the hold at T minus nine minutes. I sit back and I watch my data, but I know that there are souls on board that ship that, uh, who, whose lives are depending on, on uh, the launch team to make the right decisions. It's, uh, I don't think about that consciously. The, 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 the decision making authority and responsibility, I know it's there. Um, but I do think consciously about the crew and, and, and the people we're about to about to put on top of a controlled explosion and get to orbit. This is the NTD conducting the launch status check. All stations verify are ready to resume count and go for launch. OTC, OTC go. TVC, TVC go. ETC, ETCs go. LPS, LPS is go. Houston flight. Houston flight is go. After nearly three years, hundreds of thousands of hours logged by engineers, technicians, scientists, seamstresses, electricians, and other program workers across the globe. We have main engine start. Two, one, booster ignition. The shuttle makes its way skyward. At liftoff, 6.6 .6 million pounds of thrust begin hurtling the vehicle and crew at speeds that'll reach 17,500 miles per hour. The shuttle is like no other machine ever built. For its launch to succeed, more than a million parts must move together perfectly. How this engineering marvel came to be is an amazing story that begins in the early 1970s. The Vietnam War is divisive and costly. The economy is sliding into recession. And with the race to the moon already won, the Apollo program is canceled. A new mission is sought for NASA to send humans into space. But Mars, for many the next logical step on the path of exploration, is dismissed as too costly, a destination for a country preoccupied with events back on Earth. Instead, on January 5th, 1972, another destination is selected, low Earth orbit. As early as the mid-1960s, NASA had concluded that the technology was available to build and fly a reusable spacecraft. President Nixon really liked the idea and, uh, and, and told the NASA administrator, go do it. And the NASA administrator got a call from OMB the next morning, someone there, and said, hey, what the president really meant to say was, you're gonna get this much money, and so do as best you can with the space transportation system. And our choice, uh, logically, was well, you have to have a vehicle first, and so that, that was the birth of the space shuttle as the first in the three-part space transportation system. Many designs were considered. Often, they combined the best features of different concepts. At that time, they were looking at having jet engines on the shuttle for landing and for transporting it across the country. The idea of the lifting bodies was to bring astronauts home to conventional runway landing. Previously, all of our spacecraft, which were capsules, came down 
in the ocean. Someone came up with the idea of a vehicle that could land like an airplane. The key thing was to understand aerodynamic stability across the hypersonic, supersonic, subsonic, and landing speed type of environments that a single vehicle has to fly safely. That was the key thing that was learned from those. And you'll see it reflected in the shape of the space shuttle. One was the use of a lifting body, an aircraft with no conventional wings, only its fuselage would keep the aircraft airborne and guide it safely back to Earth. They were known as the flying bathtubs. For the first test, the M2F1 was towed behind a car, a souped up Pontiac. Whitey Whitesides drove that Pontiac across the lake bed at about 120 miles per hour, dragging this flying bathtub behind it. As well as groundbreaking, their tests could also prove ground shaking. The X-24B, a lifting body with wings, was the first such craft to land on an actual runway, as all shuttles would eventually do. Early on, the space shuttle was going to have jet engines to return for a horizontal landing, much like an airliner. The X-15 had proven fairly specifically that they could make horizontal landings very accurately, unpowered, flying a steep glide slope, that they could do a horizontal, uh, unpowered landing with the shuttle. As they tried to narrow its size, shape, and weight, engineers also considered how this new orbiter would be propelled safely out of the reach of Earth's gravity. At the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, home of the rockets that had sent every Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronaut into space. All engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. Design teams would devise the partially reusable propulsion system that would finally be adopted. The main engines were always something we paid very close attention to. Lots of moving parts, lots of, lots of uh, high energy in very tight places and very cold liquid on one side of a very small wall and very hot on the other side. When that thing finally lit off, for me, it just showed the power of a space shuttle main engine in, and then there's three on the back of an orbiter and then there's the two solid rocket motors. Um, that was probably the, the spark that, that got me so interested in the space shuttle program in general and, and what it took to actually get one engine to light, much less three and two boosters uh, to take the shuttle to orbit. As for the orbiter, spiraling costs forced NASA to abandon equipping it with its own jet engines and escape pod. Originally it was gonna be an air breathing uh, airplane that would fly to space as a rocket and then come back to Earth. The orbital maneuvering system pods that sit on the back now were to be where deployable air breathing engines would come out and it would be able to fly from uh, its intended point of landing to another place if the weather were bad or something like that. NASA's new shuttle would essentially glide its way back to Earth. Producing the components of this new space transportation system fell to familiar names in the space industry. Prime contractor Rockwell North American, now Boeing, had built the Apollo Command Service Module. Morton Thiokol, now ATK, would build the solid rocket boosters, and Martin Marietta, now Lockheed Martin, would construct the ET. Responsibility for producing the space shuttle's main engines went to Rocketdyne, now Pratt Whitney. There was a lot of teamwork that was going on. It was bringing people from all across the country, from Kennedy, from Johnson, from Marshall. So many people involved that had to have worked together. Now, at the beginning, there was a lot of anxiety that we weren't going to work together. But when people got to know each other and could trust each other, that's when the work began. It was uh, an amazing vehicle, and in a lot of ways, way ahead of its time to have a reusable spacecraft they could carry such tremendous amounts of, of uh, cargo to, uh, to space uh, was unprecedented.